Um, about three months ago, Len asked me to be the featured poet. And kind of just, um, you know, <laughs> collapsed. And the great thing is, that I spent a long time working on poems, old and new, and that's been pretty exciting. Um, just a little announcement. I, um, some of my students have come down from Oakland, and some people who don't know each other from Santa Cruz classes. I was thinking we could. And anyone else who'd like to come along, um, just go have some tea afterwards at the new tea house. So I handed out this little flyer on the table if you would like to come with us. Um, it's just a short walk away. And the other big announcement is um, I just rented a storefront space for the opening for writing classes. Mm. And um, it's in Squid Row. And we'll be starting um, classes there on the first of next month. But um, I already have keys, so if you'd like to come by, and see it on our way into the tea house. Um, okay, I wanted to thank you for this uh, introduction about the uh, don't explain the poem. There's a great uh, Robert Frost story where Robert Frost reads this poem and someone in the audience raises their hand and says, Mr. Frost, could you explain this poem to us? And he says, I'll be very happy to. And he reads the entire uh, poem. Yeah. Exactly, nothing more, nothing less. <laughs> the guy's aghast. Uh, and they, um, uh, no, no, you didn't understand me. I said, I would like you to explain the poem. He said, oh, sure. Read <laughs> the whole poem again. <laughs> um, okay. Um, you know, and the other thing I'd like to say is I really like how Joyce starts the poetry readings every week, every month, with a um, poet that she admires. And there's a very interesting, um, influential, actually, essay called Can Poetry Matter by Dana Joya. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But he's sort of talking about how we can revitalize poetry readings. And part of it is to read other people's work that you admire. So mm -hmm. I um, have a few of those as well. Um, OK. So um, I'm trying to read for you a wide variety of different work. And hopefully one of them will hit you in the right place. This one is called Huge Tides Scour Land. In tiny print, at the bottom right corner, the laminated poster says, Huge Tides Scour Land. The proximate time, four billion years ago. Someone figured that out, contested it, verified it, and now it's on my wall. The poster I bought it last summer in a funky Soho boutique, New York, found amongst skeletons bird crania, butterfly ephemera, taxidermied aardvarks, and such. Huge tides scoured land just this just after oceans form, which follows molten surface in the tiny list in tiny print at the bottom right of the laminated poster. A chart full of inferences, syllogistic analysis, pivoted on iridium layerings, stratigraphies of Australia contrasted, South African rocks. And there, even smaller, underneath, benign, beside molten surface, the words, Mars-sized planet impacts Earth, results in Earth-Moon system. I squint. The mind gasps, grasps. The lava lamp, lava lamp sploosh extruding our moon from magma, the boiling of rock, to fill my own sky with that benevolent light. Does that Mars still gravitate underneath my feet? Who deduces such things, scrying the rocks, calibrating data against data, leveraging back from 2012? These empiricist empires of uncelebrated scientists build hypothesis upon guests, inferring supercontinents colliding, dating clouds of bacteria who unknowing, diverged in marine, marine ecologies of eukaryotic amoebae and slime molds headed towards me. All under slush by tectonic migrations as the whole whirling miasma went crashing through galactic spiral arms, bombardments scarifying the biospheres with mass extinctions one after the next. Huge tides scoured land and left a text. Huge tides scoured and left a text on the land then silted and upthrust, then footprinted over and eroded beneath, all of it glossed in our times by scholars of rock, ratcheting backwards with carbon-14, and leaving their trace work strangely deracinated on a chart on my wall. So, it is 
sign the poem. Um, oops, I just explained it. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is actually um, about 15 years old. Uh, a little bit different feeling to it. Ah, it's a spiritual poem. Ah, West Oakland, the Holy Land. <laughs> Voices hushed amidst the battered dumpsters and silent warehouses. Endless waiting acres of por parking lots. Tire burial mounds and headless directionless semi-trailers. Abandoned cars. Those rusting roadside shrines of beehived oxidizing steel. Cement slabs, broken, meaningless, and pointed towards heaven. Shuddering gray chimneys, aching upwards to the expectant sky. Gape mouth metal hooks suspended from gargantuan steel girders, gleaming fields of chain link. I am anointed, blessed, blessed by this emptiness, surrounded by the great gods of diesel, coffee, and commodities. At night, the whispers, the loneliness, the purity of sentiments. Oh, the street lamp legions, impassive serried ranks, bleed haloed light into the moist night, fading into the misty ether. And now, the receiving station, doors open to the darkness, light spilling, stacked with uncountable and indistinguishable bales, crates on pallets lining wide cement aisles where forklift drivers, the disciples, pilot their whirring machines with a metallic hum underneath the cathedral of brushed tin ducts. This shining temple beckons, glowing in the darkness, in the silence calling the faithful to prayer. Okay, mm. um, uh, so there'll be a few poems here about uh, that sort of touch on a lot of places I've lived or traveled in Asia. And this is um, on the Ganges. It's called Some Something Insalubrious This Way Comes. A brown chunk of filth flows downstream on the holy Ganges, crowded above by the flies, who are dispersing the cow shit that lies all around me, far beyond my ken. Are these mocking the holy, or exerting it out of us? What is the real engine of growth? The eyes of the saint lonely for prayer, a wash in the mistakes handed down by the holy ones before us, who shat on this mo moist green earth, praying this very we into existence. Okay, um, change the order here. This is a very short one. Let's see, eight, ten words. This is uh, called Cremation Ground on the Ganges. Bathing buffalo, burning bodies, executed with the same disinterest. <laughs> mm. Okay, this is actually a translation, um, something I translated uh, from the Japanese um, by, it's a poem by an illustrator, his name is Takeshi Motai, and I actually have a couple of his books here. He's um, even today, he's having a bit of a um, recrudescence in Japan today, but he is was active in the late 40s and early 50s. And um, actually, I'll read one poem by him and then one poem sort of based on uh, my teacher who studied him. So um, I'll maybe put this out on the table for the break and you can take a look at it. It's not very um, beautiful. This is a much quieter. Um, so it's called A Huge Lonely Task Completed. A lone insect, dead, 500 years ago. A lone flower, dead, 1,000 years ago. A lonesome, enormous task, completed, and then death. This abundance, if not measured on the scales of the infinite, cannot be measured at all. It took maybe about two weeks to translate. <laughs> uh, has anyone else done translation? It's really, um, you just can't uh, <laughs> explain how much work it takes to uh, translate it. Um, okay, 
So this is actually um, something I wrote as a poem for a different kind of luxury in my second book, which I failed to bring today. But, um, oh, I should announce they're going to actually be, ha we're going to be having a reading, hopefully, at the library, but we don't have a date on it, um, for a different kind of luxury coming up. So if you're on the library's calendar, you can um, keep abreast of that. And I will be reading at the Santa Cruz Zen Center from a different kind of luxury, which is a book about um, Japanese people living very simple lives deep in the mountains today. And that will be on the 9th, right? June 9th. June 9th and what time? June 9th at 7 p.m. Thank you at the uh, Santa Cruz Zen Center, which is up near the Mission. And I may be also giving a short excerpt of the book on stage at the Japanese Cultural Fair, which is also mm. in June. Um, okay, so here's the poem. So I wrote it as a poem, and then to put it into the book. I just kind of took out all the line breaks and kind of smoothed it together. But I took it back apart for this reading here. Um, so the, uh, the background for this is that we're going through Takeshi Motai's journey to um, just show you a couple of these images here. Him uh, going to, uh, I'm explaining the poem, <laughs> uh, but they're beautiful pictures and it goes with it. Um, Takeshi Motai went to Europe in uh, 1930 from Japan and uh, made this, um, all of his journals of the time burned in the bombing during the war. And then, so he made one copy. This was just for his kid. He just made a single copy of this book. But uh, my teacher, Dosan, um, republished it later on after he died. So Dosan is explaining um, this book to me. In the dark house, in another language, interviewing an old man, scotch in between us. We, both living in the world of imagination, brought alive in color in this book the life of yet another man, further back in time, imagine and mem imagination and memory mixing in layers. Dreamlike images held in a book, his journey of 1930 long gone. We revel in the abstraction of the past, the richness of someone else's recollections. This book, one stake stuck in the ground against the fierce onrush of time. A resurrected document, militation against the burned libraries of the ages. See how we go on, said Gary Snyder. Recapitulating the patterns of the past, reinscribing the tracings of those before in our own way, again and again, becoming intimate with the brush strokes they left behind, just a few, a midden, a shell mound from which to construct a life and a past, searching in the archive of what has been and thus kept can still become. Okay, um, I'm going to break that uh, kind of uh, long-faced uh, mm -hmm. tone up. I was asked particularly by my partner to read something zany. Um, so in writing classes, I teach something you might know as um, writing from the subconscious or uh, automatic writing. And so here's a little snippet. The pruder, the pruder calico tourniquets, the way it's supposed to be in a cauldron of cannibalistic DC operatives and aardvarks with teeth marks siphoned out of a clash of cultures. Which was a friend of Willie the bong hit Meister who tipped his hand to the zebra, zebra cartilage in a bottle brush xylophone with grass growing this side of death. In short, it was my way of being nice to him, Billy Club burnt down zero tolerance kerf towards a jerkamuffin. That was the deciding impulse for the long tooth sensimia merchant who drove herd on the dogies from Amarilla funky 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 <laughs> said Anatolia from Patagonia mesquite hippolyte crusty old burnt toast of watching the Muppets cardboard telepathy from a suitcase of henchmen a la suitcase with two heaping helping tendency to zero out with a mushroom stroganoff in a Washington attic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, this is a good one. This is called How To, How To, also from India. How to keep the shit separate from the chai? That is the question. How to tell the sadhu from the shark? Who is the holy man? Who is the charlatan in me? Chanting yogini's voices call me upward. Crowds of parasites waiting to take me down. <laughs> On the same slope, they dry saris and cow shit. 
on the same steps to the river. They beat laundry and children. In the same rib cage, I have fury and prayer. Okay. Um. Okay, this is the sort of... I think I actually read this um, maybe two years ago, my first reading here. Um, I've edited it. It's called Syllables Across the Land. This is a little bit more thinky one. Shut up with that explanation. Language holds place down. Language holds place down, or we wish it would. But like everything words, it, with words, it slips. Yama, mountain in Japanese, pahar in Hindi, montagne in Francais, Montana, Vermont, Montevideo in Uruguay. We name places so that we may come back to them. This valley valediction, the valence of language, words connect on their own. Not having enough sounds for the size of this world, we find that they intersect, get intertwined, tumbling against each other, freighted with meanings. Chiria, bird in Hindi, pajaro in Spanish. Bird, hard sounds at either end, but chiria, a true bird sound. Pajaro is bird in Spanish, and pajar mountain in Hindi. Hindi from the Indus River, in Dios, that is, per Columbus, in God, the Red Indian. Dios, God, Kami, God, different sounds holding down, trying to, a non-place being, and yet even that resists. The signifier does not hold. The signified, the mountain itself, stays the same, as much as anything ever stays the same, which I suppose the mountain does in our time, a human time. Yet, even they migrate under larger forces, a Pangaea or Gondwana land in flux, thrusting plates through the crusts, creating peaks without name. Yet, I want to put stories on this word, need words to hold them there. Stories of travels across its syllabaries to push pin a memory, the faces of the people against the onrush of time. Yet, a dictionary of place names of an unknown country, of Bulgaria or some such, I cannot bring myself to love a listing of locations. Perhaps a Sophia here, a Budapest, echoing the Buddha's H. I need that breath. But the denatured gazetteer without the soil to anchor it, syllables without home. Places hold their names as people die and go on, no matter how much we try to Mumbai our beloved Bombay. Although I admit to a thickening the clotting cream when we edged from Calcutta to the more inoculant rich Kolkata. <laughs> Sounds not arbitrary. It connects with things as they are in unpredictable ways. Though linguists, doctors of the articulated tongue, no connection but the random, they say. Random, the dominant religion, with its church of probabilities, standard deviations, and means. Means. A subterfuge, I think, to get us not to get it. The words in the land, the syllables that shape what we see when we experience Japan, Nippon, Nihon, Nihon. The letters matter too, the H in Buddha, not Budapest, improves upon the bud at the street end of the branch, knowing, knowing, the K holds something. And our names are on the land, someone's ancestry, marking the earth with people, yet syllables still slipping over centuries away. Their random, even though I deviate, doesn't capture the diaphanous lug bolt connecting earth to air, that is breath, spoken over soil. Iberia, land of the Iberis, from Greek, enveloping its extremadura, hard and barren, spitting out men. At Aztec and Inca, the cut of the sea and sea, the sabaku as desert in, Jap in the Japanese with its saboten, to us just cactus spiked and spined, across which the piece of the road en français, the track, the trench, Marianas, the Mary in it, with its worms and giant squid, those massive question marks, Q, it's question mark, twisty both and subaqueous, the caliph of the Ottomans, the California, <coughs> have not yet unlocked this code, but it is not meaningless. It is meaning, even as it slips. Um, 
And last, last time there was actually a man named Berryessa who was reading here. I don't know if those of you remember him reading. And his family, uh, uh, as Basques, came here before um, the uh, Howleys and um, named it Berryessa. So uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to do a short excerpt from my first book, which is a writing called Writing Open the Mind. And uh, it's right at the end. I hid the theoretical stuff at the end. Uh, yeah, this is more an exhortation than a theory. We write to understand. Thus, we should write. But we can never fully understand. The world is shifting, and we are shifting under it. Thus, we should keep writing. Our writing is a series of approximations towards an ever-changing goal. Writing helps us take hold of things, but it doesn't lock them. It is their nature to move. The Buddha said it is vain to try to hold them, but still we feel we must. We love this world. Writing discovers some meanings and preserves them, but also it changes them. Writing interacts us with these stories and holds the alienation at bay. It is noble and just to fight back against alienation. <coughs> we start with a question in our writing, and we fling our question at the world with our thought, with our pen. The writing itself and the world fling back their answers, showing us the inadequacy of our question. Although the answers, although the answers we get in our writing are incomplete, they revise our questions and we ask again. Again, we fling ourselves at the world. Will we ever perfectly know? No. However, we try. When we ask the questions in our writing in a way that replicates the complexity of the world, the questions are better questions, the, qu the answers more true. The writing we do is also making ourselves. With the writing you make, you yourself become a revision of this world. And the more open the mind to the actual mystery and complexity of the self and the world, the more true the understanding, and we hope, the more wise the action. What a joy it is to let things emerge and know that even as they do, they are never exhausted. Our life, our life is a series of approximations towards an ever-changing goal. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe one more. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, this is actually from my third book, as yet unpublished. It's called Much, and... Um, I once did it all memorized, but I kind of unmemorized it again, but I'll do my best here. Little pieces from it. Oh, um, yeah. Full knowing, this is uh, one, two, and three. Full knowing is an illusion. The gap between the immensity of the world and the tininess of our brains, we are hardwired for mystery. In the great wash of geologic time, an infinite number of bacteria. Two. In the very thickness of the present, lurks the unknown. Meanings not to be discovered for decades crowd around offhand statements by, made by her or him not to be understood until years later after she died, after he turned on you. Not to be understood until you think back. In the thickness of the present are flummoxing waves of past events, whole Hiroshima's and Krakatoa's reverberating through the actions of teachers and businessmen and madmen in cafes. Niches for life forms torn open by dinosaur extinctifying meteors are populated now by rodents and kangaroos and coyote legends that would never have fruited on the fertile plain of earth had not the brontosaurus and stegosaurs moved left and let us in to populate the surface of a planet in an outer space of 240 billion galaxies. Three. Traces of you are left behind everywhere you move. Bloodhounds can follow this. Residues of what you did and didn't do resound around the globe. You are the tiniest speck which is also crushing microorganisms with brutal disregard. The smoke underneath your accelerator destroys the cheetah one exhaust at a time. The love you give to friends keeps the whole world alive. We chant the sutra of our own continuation ghastly and fantastic for every day of our bumbling, magnificent lives. May you echo through the universe, as you undoubtedly will. Mm -hmm.